Hi everyone, um, thank you for coming today and also thanks to my comrade Ed for inviting me and Laura today to speak at this event. Um, I'm Lynn Gibson, as the sign says, and I'm one of the founding members of the Women's Band Group based in County Durham. And I have to admit, until Ed contacted me uh, a couple of years ago now, I'd never actually heard of the Nation X, or the Black Spartans, or the football that was played by them during the First World War. So that's, that kind of led me on my own journey to find out more about these amazing women. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about what happened with women's football after the war, how women have supported the men over the years in local communities, and what the women's family group are doing to try to ensure that history does not forget these and other incredible working class women. So after the war, although women had proven themselves as skilled workers, thousands were sacked when the ex-soldiers returned. And in 1919, over 600,000 British women were registered as unemployed. So this was a terrible time for working class women. And also, despite their footballing success, their playing in football came to a rather abrupt end after the war. The FA were worried that the popularity of the women's game would take punters and money away from the men's game. So on the 5th of December 1921, the FA issued a ban saying that no member clubs could let women's teams play in their grounds, effectively sidelining women's games to parks. The FA gave a number of different reasons for this at the time. One of them was that they were concerned the money being made from the women's games was being spent frivolously when it should have been going to charity. There was no evidence of this though, and besides, the men's games didn't need to donate their profits to charitable causes. So many female players thought this was grossly unfair. Top physicians also uh, started describing football as being unsuitable for women, saying that it was too much for their bodies to handle, and that it might even affect the players' chances of getting pregnant. This was very different <laughs> from how it was treated during the war, though. So again, the female players were angry about this. And that ban lasted for over 50 years. It wasn't lifted until 1971. And then on the 3rd of March 1921, the coal mines, which uh, were mentioned earlier, were returned to the private owners. The owners then demanded a huge pay cut of up to 45%. The miners' union refused to accept the owners' new terms. And on the 1st of April 1921, one million British miners were locked out. For three months, the women formed football teams and played each other to raise money for the striking miners. The lockout lasted for three months, with the miners returning to work in early July 1921. They wouldn't have lasted that long without the financial support of the women. Now, I'm the daughter of a striking miner, and I was just eight years old when the year-long age 485 pit strike started um, to preserve the coal industry. Obviously, living through the strike, not only did I experience first-hand the force of the state against the miners, but also the support that the women in the mining communities provided to families like mine. The difference about the 84 strike, however, was the huge and unwavering support the miners received in abundance from the women in the coal mining communities, and the role that the women played in this strike was crucial. There had been conflicts before, but this time, in an act of solidarity, the women left the kitchen sink, and life for them would never be the same as they stole off stood alongside their men. Women's presence on the picket lines has been acknowledged, but their story of defiance, their skills in raising funds, promoting the cause, and standing in battle with the men is generally overlooked. And here in South Shields, there was the West Door Women's Support Group, and in County Durham, where I live, Heather Ward and Anne Suddick, who were already politically active in the Labour Party and Trade Union movement, organised women's support groups across the county, Heather in the large mining towns of East Durham, and Anne in the, small, uh, the smaller pit villages within Durham County. Now, at the time, the National Coal Board and the media tried to use the wives of miners to support an anti-strike campaign. However, high unemployment and benefit cuts on top of threats to their husband's jobs meant many of these women actually supported the strike. And it wasn't just miners' wives who were members of these support groups. The wives were joined by peace and anti-racist campaigners, students, local government workers, housewives, 
and workers from all backgrounds, all united to ensure a future for mining communities and to save jobs. Their livelihoods, their families, their communities and their way of life was under threat and this fueled that anger. So whether it was fundraising, making up food parcels, working for the first time since they had kids to bring in a wage to my mum, standing on picket lines, supporting the husbands behind the scenes or chaining themselves to call you the gates, the women were as important as the men during this strike. <coughs> I recall my good friend Heather Wood telling me at the beginning of the strike, you have to remember <coughs> that there were children starving. And when the Easington miners went on strike, we decided something must be done to help the families who were now without a wage. And so now without the means to feed themselves, we knew faction was trying to break us, so we had to galvanise as a community and band together. So Heather, her man Myrtle, and the women of SEAM, which is Save Easington Area Mines, opened and ran 14 free cafes where anyone in the community who needed feeding could get a meal. The free cafe in Easington served 500 people a day and around 800 during school holidays when the kids came down as well. One of the great legacies of the strike was that it politicised a great number of women and some like Heather and Anne, as I said before, were already political. Heather served as chairwoman on the Easington Constituency Labour Party before the strike. However, most of the women who were involved were not politically active, and politics at this point still wasn't seen as women's business. But as the strike went on, and if you look back all the time, in my communities, it's always been the women who have instigated the change. Um, in addition to fundraising and free cafes, the women went on pickets, organised events, they marched and organised rallies all over the UK and Europe, spoke in favour of the strike, despite many of these women having never spoken from a platform before. Many women were arrested and had curfews and travel restrictions placed on them to ensure they couldn't organise or show solidarity and so were even strip searched. However, police violence against women was not a new thing. You only need to look at how the suffragettes were treated to know this. Extreme acts of psychological and physical abuse were also endured by the match women, women's liberation protesters and green and common activists. In May 1984, 5,000 women from pit villages across the country attended a rally in Barnsley, and a few months later, 23,000 miners' wives marched through London. The whole movement encouraged working class women to speak about their beliefs on platforms that had in the past been reserved for middle class women. The strike was life changing for many working class women, and in many cases, these women never returned to domestic life after the strikes with some going on to have political careers. So this kind of leads me to uh, tell you a little bit about the Women's Banner Group and how we are seeking rec uh, recognition for these historically important women. So, as it was mentioned before, the munition acts were not recognised with the War Memorial, though Bella has received a blue flag. And this is something that we, in the Women's Banner Group, are striving to change locally. In County Durham, in early 2018, we discovered there were no blue plaques dedicated to women in the whole of the county Durham. Only men in buildings. And we decided that had to change. So in March 2019, we organised an event, invited members of the public and local schools to submit nominations for a woman who was from or important to county Durham to be remembered on a blue plaque and who fit the criteria for the council. To take part in the customs event where the women will be submitted to the Durham County Blue plaque scheme, and the Women's Banner Group will be credited with having the first female blue plaque erected in County Durham. We held the event in March 2019 at Red Hills in Durham, and there was 10 nominations received. And after the speeches in support of the women, all of the nominations were voted on in a secret ballot. And after a three way tie, the first, three submissions went into Durham County Council. And after a long delay due to COVID, the three plaques for the Acre Angels, who were munitions workers at Law 59 during World War II, Kate Maxey, who was one of the most decorated nurses from World War I, and Bella Lawson, who was a suffragist and a passionate pioneer and promoter of child welfare clinics. These were all erected in November last year. And just to wrap up, for those of you who don't know or have never heard of the Women's Man Group, we were founded in 2017 by socialist women 
to recognise and celebrate the achievements of working class women in the Durham Cornfield that history has forgotten. We created a mass movement in 2018, which was the International Year of the Woman, and it resulted in over 100 women marching with us at Durham Big Union at the gala that year with our original community banner, which was created by more than 50 women from the rest of the Durham Cornfield. However, since we sort of um, got together in 2017, we've actually morphed into much more than just a banner group. We provide a space for women to come together to campaign on topics such as making misogyny a hate crime, universal credit, or speak, anti-racism campaigning, just to name a few. And you'll be hearing from uh, Laura later in the programme. If you're interested in joining Women's Banner Group, uh, just to be kept up to date on our events and, and what we're getting on with, then just email, it's just womensbannergroup at gmail.com, really easy to remember. Or you can grab Laura and I at the end. Thanks for listening.